Okay, I think we can get started. So good afternoon, every, everybody. My name is Patrick Roosh, uh, research staff member at IBM Research, and I'll be your host for today's uh, third scientific lecture in a series of three organized by the Trust Eat project. Um, so I'm very happy today to have um, four colleagues uh, with us from, from IBM. We have uh, Tony Storr, uh, Gianmarco Gabrielli, uh, Krista Leonti, and Dan Gruhl. Um, that will be uh, sharing the stage for three talks. Um, uh, they will describe themselves, uh, what they're up to, um, some words of introduction in terms of the Trust Eat project. Um, this is about uh, building a trusted um, food supply chain uh, for the future, relying on blockchain tech and advanced sensors. So uh, this framing has set the stage for these three scientific lectures. And today I'm very happy to have the focus on the interface between the physical world and the digital world um, represented by um, advanced sensing techniques and different use cases um, uh, relevant to the food industry and others. So um, this is a, a trustee is a, a European Union funded project in the Horizon 2020 framework um, with the three partner institutions. Uh, so the Iberian International Nanotechnology Lab, INL, uh, Wageningen University and Research and IBM Research. And so with that, the different areas of the technology and application space are, are covered. And um, since we have three talks, I'm not going to talk more about <laughs> anything else. I'd like to hand over the word to our first speaker and we'll start off with, uh, with Tony, um, who will introduce us to the Verifier Suite, um, describing mobile sensing and AI uh, with a focus on authenticity um, and also application and food safety. So Tony, over to you and um, uh, the stage is yours. You can share your screen. Uh, perfect, I think you, wonderful. Um, so hello everyone, um, delighted to be here. Um, let me just uh, take over the screen. There we go. So my name is um, Tony Storr. I, uh, I've been with IBM for um, oh, just over 30 years now, would you believe? And I, I'm a partner and I lead IBM's uh, mobile services. So you might wonder what the mobile guy is doing here talking about verification suite, but that will, um, that will become apparent sort of as we go through. So there's a, there's a number of different technologies, but what they, what they come down to really is this question. How do you know if something is genuine and how do you know if something is high quality? And I'm talking about how do you know if you have no technology at your disposal? There's just you. How do you know if something is real or fake or if something is compromised? And the answer is, of course, we're human beings. You might look at it um, or you might smell it to see um, if, it's, if it's right or wrong. You might even taste it. Uh, you might touch it and you might listen to it. And you may think um, if we're talking about food, you don't listen to food, but just think about tapping a watermelon just to see how ripe it is or listening to the fizz in a glass of champagne. Is it right or is it wrong? So as human beings, we kind of use all of these different senses to try and work out if something is real or fake or good or bad. And this is really where we've got from different areas of IBM research to say, what if we could augment the human senses? What if we could see better than we can see and smell better than we can smell and taste better than we can taste to augment the human ability to see if things are good or bad or real or fake? So there are a whole suite of technologies. I'm going to be talking about vision in a moment, seeing how, we're, how we can look at the microscopic level to see if things are real or fake. And then you're going to hear about taste uh, and smell. And of course, there are other senses as well. We have um, a, you know, technology that can listen or even sense vibrations or even some technology where you can use your phone and, and 3D scan something. And then when something arrives at the other end, see if it matches the scan. So lots of, lots of different um, levels of, um, of technology that we can, we can apply. So we're gonna start with the, with the visual verifier. Um, so this one came out of our labs in Yorktown. Um, and really we're trying to see things at the microscopic level. Now, one of the issues you've always had in terms of um, verification and, uh, and, and traceability uh, is very similar to the uncertainty principle. And if you don't know about the uncertainty principle, it sort of says, if there is a particle, you can either know where it is or what its velocity is. You can't see a particle and know exactly where it is or work out where it's traveling at the same time. You can know one or the other. 
And the same has been true in terms of verification for a while. On the physical level, you can see something and you kind of know what it is. I kind of know this is an avocado. Uh, or you could know where things came from because you had the blockchain data. But you couldn't necessarily do those two things together. If I have an avocado, I know what it is, but I don't know where it came from. And from my blockchain data, it can tell me the thing in my hand is an avocado, but it might look like a banana. It might smell like a banana, um, purely because someone has taken a barcode off an avocado and put it on a banana. So that those two things have always been fairly distinct, um, the physical and the digital. And what we're doing here is really putting those two things together. Now, uh, this sort of started with the concept of crypto anchors, and they tend to be things that you add to physical products to make them unique. So, for example, you know, putting um, tiny computers inside luxury handbags or uh, stamping edible ink onto malaria pills. But if you're selling food, you don't really want tiny computers in bed, even you don't want edible ink. In fact, what you want to verify is the thing itself, rather than verifying something that has been added to it, such as the crypto anchor. So this is where we started with vision. And we said, what if physical goods could be verified at a microscopic level? And actually even deeper than that, what if we could do that not with expensive equipment, but just using a commercially available smartphone um, with a small attachment to allow us to do that? And if we're doing it on a phone, how about if we can make it work online and offline? So you can literally make it work out in the field when you have no connectivity. And that's what the visual verifier it is. So originally designed to detect counterfeit and maintain integrity of products, but many clients are also interested in looking for quality to see if there's any sort of defect that they can do visually. Clearly we're here for sort of trust eat, and this is a big issue for the food and beverage industry. Even if you just look in the, in the US, you know, food fraud costs 10 to $15 billion per year, you know, and 337 food recalls in 2019. And we think a significant proportion of those could have been prevented if they were using some sort of verification technology. So in terms of the, uh, in the, the sort of concepts for this, you know, you could use this anywhere. If you can verify food or uh, ingredients at any stage of the supply chain or distribution chain, then, you know, field inspectors could use their phone to identify quality and contamination at manufacturing or delivery personnel when they are delivering batches of milk or, or picking them up or restaurant inspectors. And you could come up with hundreds of other um, examples of where this technology could be used. In concept, uh, it's very sim simple. The, um, there's some magic that happens in terms of the IBM AI software. We train models to recognize uh, what's good, what's bad, what's real, what's fake, what's high quality, what's low quality. Um, and then we just apply that to a mobile phone. At the moment, we're doing that um, for Samsung, uh, Samsung phones. That's just where we started to manufacture, but the technology works on iPhones and, and other, uh, other handsets as well. And there is an optical attachment. Um, I don't know if you can see in my little video window, but there's a very ugly lump of plastic on a mobile phone here with a detachable liquid holder. Um, there's a far more beautiful one in the picture you can see here. What I have is the early 3D printed one. And if we have time, I'll do a rapid, um, rapid demo and we'll see if I can tell the difference um, between something sort of on this call. A lot of clients are used, uh, interested in using this because they don't have time to wait for a lab to send things off to the lab. If someone returns luxury goods, you want to know instantly. Or if you're out in the field, you need an instant result. So this can be used as a primary control or a secondary control. In, in terms of what we can verify, um, almost anything you can imagine. And you may think, why are we talking about artwork? But let me just show you, uh, assuming the uh, technology works, just a very quick uh, video. We have a company called Authentify. And what you're going to see here is the verifier attached to a robot arm. And here we're using it to scan high quality artwork at the microscopic level to identify fraud in the art industry. And that's going to really shake up that industry. We also think we may be able to identify an artist just from the brushstrokes because we're looking at that level of detail. So interesting, but not quite related to food. Then we've got things in terms of medicine um, and two things we can do with the visual verifier. We can look at the light signature of something, the unique light fingerprint of light reflecting or refracting or passing through an object and recognize that with the verifier. Or we can look at the microscopic surface. And when we're looking at pharmaceuticals like tablets, sometimes you find in the fake pills, the powder clusters in a different way than it would to the genuine pills. 
So we can also do um, paper or currency for the food industry. This is very interesting when you start doing packaging. Uh, because we're looking right down at the one micron level, we can identify the weave of the paper and a whole load of other things you just don't see with the human eye. Um, we can also do things like oils. Um, in fact, one of the very first demos we did at the Think Conference a few years ago was on olive oil, just showing we could see a difference between extra virgin olive oil and olive oil that has been pressed more than once, because that's a huge problem for that um, industry. And we can do liquids, we can do perfumes. There is a IBM perfume, believe it or not. I think it smells like a hybrid cloud, whatever that means. Um, but also we can do um, contaminants in water. Um, I'm just starting a trial with a, uh, with a spirits manufacturer. Um, we saw with the verifier, we could see a difference between two different brands of vodka, but also when we put water in vodka, we could see a difference. And if you think about that, water in vodka is a clear liquid in a clear liquid, but we could still see a difference with the verifier unit. So really interesting to see how, uh, how accurate we can make that model. And again, almost anything you can think of. But also in terms of agriculture, we can we can look at plants for diseases or fungus or molds growing on them. Um, and we did a trial with an academic uh, institute and a chocolate manufacturer just looking at cacao plants just to see if we could see disease on the leaves um, you know, before a human being would normally spot it. So that was an early trial, but again, very positive results. We were as good as a human being just with the proof of technology and, and uh, the models will only get better. So right up and down the supply chain. We believe we can do seeds. We haven't done any trials yet, but seeds again, visually, um, can you see a difference between genetically and non-genetically modified seeds or fruit? Uh, there was a company asking us to look at how ripe mangoes are and whether we can see a difference between different fruit from different parts of the world and almost anything you can think of again there. And then finally, one other thing we can do with the verifier is bacteria. So let me show you the world's most boring video. There you go, there's the world's most boring video. What makes that interesting is that's bacteria. We're looking at um, bacteria and identifying it not from the way it looks, but from the way it swims. So here we're training the model on something moving, which is bacteria, and then applying it in the field to something moving to identify what that thing is. Now, in, in, the, last, um, in the last year and a half, um, of course, at this point in the presentation, someone will ask me, can we identify viruses? Um, the answer is no. Unfortunately, viruses are a thousand times smaller. Otherwise, the world would be a much better place. But we're, but we're kind of looking at it. So in, in terms of how uh, the visual verifier works, um, we start by training models. We work with clients to establish a unique signature of whatever it is they want to look at. And then when we've trained a model, it's as simple as using the smartphone to essentially take an image and then process it instantly on the device or on the cloud. Um, and it will come back with a level of confidence saying, yes, it's this level of confidence. I think this is extra virgin olive oil and I'm 99.6% sure or whatever it is a client is asking us to look at. Training a model uh, varies in complexity depending on the substance, but you know it, it's days or weeks. We're not talking about great big sort of AI, um, AI type projects. Um, we look at samples, we look at multiple samples, and really it's whatever the client wants to look at. Is it real or fake? Is it differences in different parts of the world? Is it different qualities um, within the product? Um, and then run them on the phone. And as I said, we're down at this um, down at this level of, of one micron, which is why we can do the bacteria, which means we can also see animal cells or plant cells um, as well. Um, in terms of uses for this, clients have got uh, a few different um, uh, things that they want to do. Sometimes they just want to see if two things are different. Looking at the microscopic level, are these two things different? Did they come from the same batch or a different batch? Sometimes it's identification. Look at something and it will tell you what that thing is if you don't know. And sometimes it's is something genuine or is something of the right quality. But again, we can train models to sort of look at anything. Uh, so that, that was the end of my uh, quick rattle through the chart. Um, I am prepared to go into a quick demonstration, but just while I'm preparing that, are there uh, any questions at this stage? So feel free to unmute yourselves or, or raise your hand. Do you want to ask a question? Marta. Yes. <laughs> Hello, Tony. That was really, really nice and really interesting. Um, I just have a very practical question um, because you were presenting the work with the, with the bacteria. I mean, I understand that this can be like 
in early stage maybe or or just applicable for some solutions but i was thinking you know in the way we normally do it in the in the lab we really need a very um, for example, in the case of foodborne pathogens, we really we need, really need something that is extremely sensitive because you are supposed to detect up to I don't know one uh, colony forming unit in maybe twenty five grams. So that will, I mean, it will be difficult to to see it. I guess through the maybe you have a, a different experience through the um, through the camera and then. Would that require some type of sample preparation, for example? Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, we, we always need samples when we're pulling things together. And you're right, with bacteria, we've done some um, experimentation to know that we can see it. And, and uh, the reason why we were doing that on video rather than still images is, of course, you're counting the amount of live bacteria. So as well as identifying it, you're, you're actually counting how many of them are moving within a certain a period. So we know we can do that to a certain degree um, on, you know, research have done that sort of in the lab. Um, but, but you're right, we haven't we haven't expanded that out yet to say, can we always do it, you know, if bacteria are on meat or bacteria are on other surfaces or substances, uh, but, but we're open to, 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 to push those experimentation. So I can't make any wild claims that we've that we've done that and that one's ready to go. That's probably further behind some of the more static visual use cases, but plenty of opportunities there. And there's a lot of interest, as you might expect. Yeah, that's that's really that's really nice. I mean, that that's a really nice. Yeah approach, I would say. Any other questions or shall I go into a quick demo? Hey, Tony, uh, before you go to the demo, I was gonna ask you, I mean, have you guys been working on uh, other types of uh, uh, tactile, uh, uh, you know, applications? I mean, obviously at INL, we have a number of uh, areas of interest, right? Of course, you know, this is obviously a blockchain and sort of food sort of angle discussion. But I think it's really interesting. I mean, for us, we're really interested on, on, you know, what do we need to do to help from an analytic perspective to unlock that seventh digital sense, right? And earlier you were talking about, uh, you know, basically enhancing senses. And, uh, you know, we really follow and believe in that um wealth of being able to train um, your body to sense and heal things in a different way, right? I mean, there's already a lot of projects I'm using, you know, vests to train traders of, you know, uh, with sensors of how they actually, what, a, you know, good trades or bad trades feel like, or airline pilots, you know, I mean, by the time they, they see a missile coming in a plane, they're probably, probably too late and they're dead, but the airplane can actually see the missiles coming in, you know, way ahead of time. So with sensors in the, in the back of their, their pilot suits, they can actually sort of, on the simulator, send signals to let them feel and develop that additional umwelt or, or the way they perceive the world around them to train them to be more receptive. And in doing so, I think we can do that with other different applications, right? And, and now with uh, cellular technology, 5G and 5, 6G coming uh, in a few years later, I think uh, the, the developments are gonna be huge. And for us working on, on tactile surfaces and tactile sensors, I think it will make a big, big difference uh, down the road, especially for for blockchain and food, uh, you know, detection and other a lot of applications. So, I, you know, that's sort of I, I was just trying to see what other areas have you guys worked on from an IBM perspective. Yeah, so so we do a lot. So so um, when I, when I'm not talking about Verify, which I do talk about a lot, you know, my, my day job is running the the kind of the mobile services piece, and that and that really um, turns up into being sort of the human experience piece on top of things. So you know when you um, you know we're doing a lot of work on digital twins at the moment, and and the people are doing digital twins of wind farms and other bits and pieces. But how do you experience that sort of as a human being? And it's not it's not two by two tables on a mobile phone. It's like um, virtual reality headsets or augmented reality headsets that you can kind of see 3D models of the thing in front of you. And then, as you were saying, then do you um, do you then augment those senses because you're delivering things in a far more practical way? And you know, and we work with. Um, parties that have got these um you know the gloves that gives you the sensory feedback so you can have training scenarios that allow people to sort of see and feel things in reality before they actually go into a situation so yeah there, there, there's a lot of that we do sort of outside of, of, of the kind of the blockchain and verification side of things thank you 
Super. Thanks for the question. So yeah, Tony, I think we have we have time for your demo. I'll do a, I'll do a quick demo if I uh, assuming all that technology works okay. Okay. So hopefully you're now seeing an Android screen. Is that right? Yes, we are. Wonderful. I will go into this. So this is a demo version of the Verifier app. It's not the one that we kind of build for clients. And this will just look at two things. If I take the casing off, um, you'll see my dirty desk, a typical IT person, and two vials of brown liquid. Um, not, nothing sinister in there. I got those this morning. And what those, what those two things are, actually, was the filter coffee I was drinking and the instant coffee that my... Um, that my stepson was drinking. Um, and I just thought, if I'm gonna do a demo, let's see if we can tell the difference. So if I if I turn the light source on, uh, and I haven't done this yet, so I put in the first vial. So this is the filter coffee I was drinking. So I'm gonna choose a material, it's a new material. Uh, so I will just call it coffee. And we'll kind of see what happens. Um, and then I'm gonna hit calibrate. So for everything we look at, there's some smart technology that works out how to do the, um, the, the, the visioning and the different settings overriding what the camera does. Um, and this has just taken just a quick reading of that particular vial. If I stick in the instant coffee, um, and uh, this could be a tiny difference that we can hardly see, or it could be a big difference, I don't know. Oh, it's a big difference. Okay, well, I'm delighted by that. So, um, so there was a big thing. But what are we looking at there? What we're looking at there is just the saturation of the of the light that's coming back off those two samples. If we were to instead look at the color of the light, uh, the top graph is what I took in the original sample, and I hit the target. And we're, yeah, okay. So on this one, we're also seeing a difference in the color of the instant coffee um, and the uh, and the filter coffee. And we can also look at other things like the value and the hue and saturation. So the value of the light. Is, okay, so this, this one is a big shift. Sometimes we get small shifts, but the computer can still read them. Sometimes we get big shifts. And I can look at just the hue and the saturation of the light. So, um, so that was actually just a very quick demo where that showed there was there's actually a massive difference between the coffee I was drinking and the coffee that my stepson was drinking. So I, was, I always do a different demo every time just to keep myself interested. But that just shows um, instantly with two things that do look virtually the same as these two did, um, I did see quite a quite a big difference. Um, of course, if, if, you're, if we're building a model for clients, we're building an app for clients, um, you won't see graphs that, um, that a human has to interpret. It will just say, you know, filter coffee, 98% accuracy or, or whatever, whatever the client kind of wants it to do. So I'll stop at that point. That's the, that's the end of my formal charts. Hopefully that gave you an insight into the technology. I'm happy to take more questions or to go on to the next technology. Super. Thank you very much, Tony, also for building in this, this live demo in the end with the interesting example, right? And for sharing what, you know, what your coffee preference is and, and your stepson's. That's uh, <laughs> very good. So, um, yeah. So in the interest of time, uh, you know, as always, uh, feel free to connect with me if you want to reach Tony or, uh, you know, reach out to Tony directly um, for follow-ups. Uh, thank you so much for being here with us, Tony, and for the exciting talk. Um, we will move on to the next, next presentation now. Um, and next up, according to the agenda, is uh, Gianmarco. So uh, Gianmarco is going to um, talk to us about liquid and beverage characterization um, using an AI-assisted electronic tongue, uh, codenamed Hypertaste. So Gianmarco, we're looking forward to your presentation. Right. Um, can, you see, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. OK, that's great. Uh, yeah, so I'm Gianmarco Gabrieli from IBM Research Europe, located in Zurich. And today I'd like to share with you uh, an example on how we can use a uh, portable miniaturized device for liquid and beverage characterization. Uh, in particular, I will uh, present uh, uh, Hypertaste, our AI assisted electronic tongue, um, with which we leverage uh, mobile and cloud platforms. So I will first uh, uh, introduce the, um, the data-driven approach that we use with our multi-sensor array system. And then I will give you some more insights into the, the technology with uh, sensor preparation, the automated training procedure and machine learning pipeline. And then uh, some more examples on the liquid characterization and the beverage characterization uh, from the point of view of the discrimination of different uh, beverages 
as well as the estimation of qualities and attributes. And then before concluding my presentation, I would like to show a small uh, demonstration of our proof of concept. So with respect to conventional chemical sensors in which uh, um, each of the sensor placed on a sensor array is highly selective towards a specific component. And what we do uh, basically is to uh, rely on the response of that specific sensor in order to trace back an information of a targeted analyte. When we use cross-sensitive sensor array, like in the case of hypertase, we actually boost the sensitivity of the sensor placed on sensor array. And uh, in this case, what we want to do is to achieve the maximum sensitivity of the sensors to as many analytes as possible. So in this case, what we need to do is to actually evaluate uh, the overall response coming from the sensor array. And um, this is quite different with respect to the conventional chemical sensor, sensor principle. So in order to uh, actually interpret this response, we cannot use conventional techniques and we need to use um, AI and machine learning algorithm in order to find the hidden pattern inside this uh, response. So uh, specifically with hypertaste, we have built our own uh, technology stack, starting from the development of sensing materials such as uh, conductive polymers. And we have linked those to an hardware which is able to uh, collect the data and provide the data to a mobile platform. Then the mobile platform is also able to uh, display those data and to um, eventually provide the result of the analysis. However, we need uh, also the simultaneous effort of uh, AI and IoT platforms in order to reprogram the sensor array to be used in many fields of application. So uh, we can think of using hypertaste for, uh, for quality control in supply chain and manufacturing. Uh, as well as in the food industries, environmental analysis, or life science studies. And uh, in all the application in which we use uh, AI, we usually need uh, eventually to follow a specific pipeline. So we need to ingest some data coming from the field. And uh, after, um, uh, let's say, evaluating those data and analyzing those data, we have been able to get insight into the, the information coming from the field. And uh, specifically in this pipeline, what we need to do with electronic tanks is to find the right machine learning models which can actually interpret the, the data coming from the edge in the best way to get an insight into the liquid we are trying to, to characterize. And to do so, we actually follow a completely chemometric approach. So we expose our sensor array to a set of liquids and only based on the on the data that we record during uh, such training, we are then able to infer uh, a chemical information. And of course, in order to do that, we need um, both to, um, let's say, test uh, many times the same liquid, but also uh, to test as many liquids as possible. So this is mo mostly a statistical approach. Uh, however, in order to uh, interpret this, uh, the data that we obtain, as I said, and in order to find a pattern in this, we need to leverage uh, machine learning. And specifically for hypertaste, we follow two different approaches. So we first apply um, an unsupervised uh, technique in, in order to um, explore the data and eventually perform a clustering analysis. And I will show a few examples uh, later. And then we shift to supervised uh, uh, pattern recognition method and specifically for the quantification of certain uh, uh, properties or concentration of certain analytes, we need to uh, train union multivariate calibration systems. So with hypertaste, we, uh, we use this portable and miniaturized device uh, without um, a physical connection, but it can be a wireless communication to a smartphone for direct measurement in liquid. We expose the sensor array first to a reference liquid and then to uh, a series of test liquids that we use for uh, training the system. And specifically, we measure voltage values uh, thanks to the potentiometric response of conductive polymers. And we use the reference solution to condition the sensor and to provide a reference signal. When we uh, collect enough data for training the sensor, we are then able to pre-process those data, extract the feature, and uh, deploy the trained model on a cloud platform. So 
whenever we are then in the field that we want to actually test an unknown liquid, we want to infer the concentration or the class of a certain liquid, then we need to provide the test data to uh, the deployed model. And after pre-processing, uh, feature extraction, and uh, application of the fully automated pipeline, we are then able to infer a concentration or a class and visualize the, the result on a, on a mobile platform. So as I said, we use uh, conductive polymers as sensing materials, which are known to interact with both uh, charged molecules uh, and neutral ones. And the overall potential of the system arising at the electrode interface is uh, depending on the Nernst-Planck equation and the Poisson equation. However, when we uh, have such a complex system with many targeted ions and the presence of multiple interference, solving those equations will be quite prohibitive. And that's why, uh, as I said, we shift to a fully chemometric approach with data-driven multisensor array. So the preparation of the sensor occurs thanks to the electrode deposition in which we um, trigger as um, a cascaded reaction uh, from the monomer up to the formation of a polymeric film on top of the electrode surface. And we use such technique because uh, it allows us also to integrate on the same substrate uh, multiple uh, uh, polymers. So specifically, we use um, four different base polymers, P dot, uh, polypyrrole, PANI, and PABA, which we can deposit with different uh, techniques. So uh, chronomperometry or cyclic voltammetry in our case. And uh, basically, we dope these polymers with different doping techniques in order to uh, give a cross-sensitive uh, sensor array design. And from those 16 polymers, we measure 15 differential voltages. So during training of the sensor, what we do is to continuously measure those uh, 15 traces. And to do so, we have uh, built our, our in-house robotic platform, which is able to reproduce the measurement methodology. So we first dip the sensor in a reference solution, then we lift up again the sensor, rotate the platform, and dip it back in the test solution, uh, and then back in the reference. And we continuously measured the, the, the data during this operation without using any conventional reference electrode, which is known to be unpractical for remote sensing applications. So from those 15 differential voltages, we um, actually extract uh, multiple informations, uh, which are called features. And uh, those features not only uh, are obtained from the final equilibrium condition of the sensor, uh, but also from the time-dependent response when we dip the sensor inside the liquid. And uh, we have noticed that such information can be really helpful in distinguishing different classes of concentration of different liquids. Uh, however, while some of those features may vary linearly with a variation of a certain uh, uh, property, some others may deviate from such linear trend. And that's why uh, we have realized that using nonlinear models such as uh, regression trees could be uh, more powerful with respect to linear models for the, for the prediction of a quantity. So while in the case of multiple linear regression, what we do basically is to assume a linear relationship between the data points that we extract, uh, the variation of an ion or a certain um, property. And based on that, we learn a linear function in a multivariate space. In the case of the extra t regressor, we follow a completely different approach. So we start from the data set with, that, we, that we have. And from there, we uh, extract multiple sub data sets. There, we start then a series of uh, binary decision trees, which are guided through the random feature selection. And basically, when we want to infer uh, the property of a certain analyte, we need to combine the decision of the trees uh, given by this ensemble method. So the metrics to estimate how good a model is, <laughs> in our case, um, is the mean absolute error, which is basically the the average of the difference between the predictions that we make and the actual values, and the relative counterpart, which is the mean relative error. So for the liquid characterization, um, we have first uh, tried to characterize the array cross sensitivity. So we have tested the same uh, uh, solution, uh, uh, the same concentration of different uh, ions, so in different six solutions, 
And we have seen in the principal component analysis that we were able to completely distinguish the six different liquids. And this difference is due to the cationic type uh, inside the liquid. Also, another powerful way to uh, estimate the array cross sensitivity was to test multiple concentration for the same ion. And we repeated this for multiple ions. And when we plotted these on the same principal component space, we have seen the, uh, the different trajectory followed by each of the tests for each of the ion. And this was uh, the, the best proof of the array cross sensitivity. So, when we wanted this set to test uh, multi-ion mixtures, in this case, I show an example of uh, two ion mixtures. We need to define discrete concentration values for those ions and test uh, possible combinations uh, occurring in a mixture. So after testing those mixtures, we are then able to uh, build a model for uh, regression and uh, uh, prediction of the concentration of the two ions. Uh, actually, uh, we have also tried to um, uh, train the extra three model using only one of the differential voltage at, at the time. And we have seen and realized that the combined sensor array response is uh, generally better with respect to um, the, the response of the error that we get uh, using only one differential voltage at the time. This is always value for sodium in this particular case. But only in one case for iron, we uh, have seen um, one of the differential voltage, which was quite similar in the prediction with respect to the combined sensor array. However, if you use only this uh, differential voltage, we are not able to detect uh, simultaneously uh, sodium and iron at the best prediction error. Now, for the uh, discrimination of beverages, what we are trying to do was to test uh, four different commercial orange juices uh, using the same pipeline that I've described so far. And we were able with hypertaste to distinguish and to resolve both the brand of those orange juices as well as the package in which those orange juices were uh, stored. Also with the same four different uh, commercial orange juices, uh, we also conducted the, uh, an aging study. So what we did uh, with hypertaste was to test uh, the same juice after, uh, under different uh, aging condition. So in these principal component plots, you see many data points coming from different aging conditions and um, uh, the same marker and color represent the same aging condition. So you see here I highlighted one of the cluster for the, for the aging. Uh, then we asked uh, a set of uh, sensory panelists to drink uh, those juice and to express the willingness to buy or not the juice. And uh, it was really interesting to notice that when we map this acceptance into the hypertaste principal component space, we were able to distinguish two different uh, groups. So the, the juice that were accepted by the panelists, uh, at least 50% of the sensory panel group and the juice which were not uh, uh, accepted by the panelists. And this is really important because if we can separate uh, the two groups, we are then able to estimate uh, the shelf life boundary of a certain uh, orange juice. So in order to uh, quantify uh, in a certain way how hypertaste could predict uh, if a certain juice would have been accepted or not, what we needed to do was to train a binary classifier so to say accepted or not. And we are trying to do that, uh, to do, to do that both with uh, hypertaste and using the descriptor scores which were given by the sensory panelists themselves. So the same panelists that test uh, and uh, revealed if they would have accepted or not the juice, they also scored the, the juice um, for four different descriptors. So sweet, sour, cooked, and juicy. And if we used all the descriptors coming from the overall sensory panels, uh, we are able to get um, uh, a classification accuracy, which is lower with respect to what we can do with hypertaste in predicting the, um, the acceptance of the juice. So another test we did was with different uh, coffee blends. So we have tested 10 different uh, coffees. And we were able to uh, resolve in the, um, in the principal component space all the, um, all the different blends that we tested. Also here in the principal component space, uh, we uh, 
I wrote here down the intensity reported on the on the label um, of the commercial coffee blend. And what we have tried to do was to uh, predict the intensity of the coffee using a regression algorithm. In this case, uh, the Gaussian process regressor. And we got a mean relative error of around 10% for the prediction of, it, of, the, of the intensity. So if we repeat the same procedure for different uh, and multiple attributes, uh, similar to the intensity of a certain coffee, then we are able to actually um, map and to reproduce uh, the sensory profile of a certain coffee blend. And this is what we have tried to do with these uh, different uh, coffees. Also, we have used uh, really simple uh, techniques for classification of different beverages. So we use a simple linear discriminant analysis for the test that we have performed with four different uh, uh, mineral waters, which are sold in, uh, in Switzerland and uh, five different uh, beers. And you see that the classification accuracy is really high in both cases. And um, here we plot the confusion matrix in which we compare the prediction that we make with hypertaste with the true class of a certain test. So ideally, we will have all the uh, tests placed on the diagonal of such matrix. Uh, and the ones which are outside of the matrix are the misclassification of, uh, of our models. So after we have seen this test with uh, water and beers, we have also uh, tried to test uh, plant protein powders, which we dissolve in um, different uh, uh, mineral waters. So um, what we, we did was to test three different vendors for pea and soy protein, and one vendor for the, for the bean protein. And we have seen the principal component space that we were able to first group the, the test depending on the, on the protein type, so PEEP, so your bean protein, and then to um, also differentiate uh, with the different clusters between the different uh, uh, vendors. Then if we also try to um, uh, test multiple or different concentrations of, uh, of those proteins, we have seen uh, here in this example that for P protein, we were able to discriminate the different concentration of proteins dissolved in, uh, in water. And particularly with the first principal component, we were able to separate the, the vendor and with the second principal component, the, um, the, the concentration of a certain protein. So I'd like to conclude the presentation with a short demo of uh, the way we use hypertaste so we have the sensor now, which is dipped inside the reference solution, as I uh, explained during the measurement methodology section. And we move the sensor into the test solution after a certain amount of time. So we can see in the screen of uh, our smartphone how the uh, potentiometric response varies when we move the sensor from the reference liquid to the test liquid. So you see this difference is due to the, to the sensitivity of the polymers to the ions which are inside the, the test solution with respect to, to, to the reference solution composition. So when we uh, collect enough data uh, for, uh, for the model, what we need to do is to send this data over to the cloud where there is the uh, machine learning model that we have trained in the lab. We compare this data to the model and we get back the result of the, of the quantification. So in this case, uh, we try to quantify uh, four different ions, uh, aluminum, copper, sodium, and, um, and iron. So, so far we have shown with hypertaste how we can perform fast uh, potentiometric sensor using this data-driven uh, cross-sensitive uh, sensor array. And we have shown how this can enable new way in which we use a portable device for remote sensing application. But of course, we need the convergence of AI, IoT, and cloud platforms in order to fully decentralize those uh, analyses. And we hope with this uh, technique to build uh, a common framework that can uh, include data, training, and testing pipelines. And with this, I would like to conclude the presentation and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Marco, for the clear presentation. Are there questions, comments? May I ask a question, Patrick? Go ahead, Hugo. 
Yeah, so Gianmarco, thank you so much. Excellent, uh, excellent presentation. I have a couple, couple of questions uh, uh, for you. One is about the, the conductive polymers. Are these materials developed uh, by you or you actually used something that was already uh, developed uh, in the, from the literature? I was not sure when I was watching the presentation. Yeah, so basically we acquired the monomers and then we um, electro deposit the polymers ourselves. So okay. We use a potential state to deposit the polymers. Okay, okay. So uh, other other question is about the sensitivity to the, to the matrix. So how do you have to uh, uh, adjust the calibration models as you change matrices? Uh, yeah, and, and I think uh, uh, you showed excellent. Uh, yeah, it was great the the classification. But have you are you been also to do some kind of quantitative uh, measurements of the of the ions, and and if yes, which I believe yes, what is more or less uh, the the error that this is associated with uh, with that uh, measurement? Yeah, so I've shown in the presentation only one of the tests that we did for um, you know the sodium and iron mixture for the for the quantification. But we had also done that with a um, single ion solution and, or for other type of, uh, of mixtures. So, of course, the, the error, the prediction error depends strongly on the, um, on the matrix of ions under test, right? And since yeah. we do not have uh, any selective sensor, we need to, um, and we use a fully data driven approach. The best way to handle this is to reproduce during the training phase as much as possible what we expect uh, in reality, or even better test in reality <laughs> and get back to a training model. Yeah, that, that's, that's uh, yeah, yeah. That's what I was, was thinking because, yeah, because the matrix influence a lot and probably also uh, the level, if you find very uh, different levels, I believe that the responses can be more difficult than to, if you are, of course, looking for the smallest components, it can be a little bit more problematic, I believe. Yeah, it depends also on the concentration levels and yeah, on the possible interference as well. Okay, thank you. I see another question from Begonia. Yeah. Thank you very much for the very nice presentation, Gianmarco. I have a couple of questions. Uh, one, it's related with the, with the conductive polymers as well, as uh, some of those can be used to, to generate molecular imprinted polymers. Uh, have you thought on using uh, this system to select uh, the most proper polymers for producing MIPS? Yes. So. Um... We have actually tried uh, um, in other application to uh, produce uh, molecularly imprinted polymers. Uh, so we have tried um, uh, last year with um, uh, small molecules like uh, acetaminophen. We have tried to imprint this uh, molecule in the polymer and we have shown the, um, that uh, some of the polymers were able to, you know, to accept this, uh, this imprinting while some others did not show any sensitivity. So we have tried with a few molecules, but uh, some of the polymers have shown uh, interesting results. Uh, nice, uh, I think uh, it could be a very nice way for, for selecting those. Um, and uh, the other question is related with the, with the number of uh, measurements that you need to perform in the same uh, kind of uh, solution and with the same amount of the of the analyte in order to generate your trees, and related with that, uh, how the the um, variability of the response on the different sensors that you can use uh, can in uh, can interfere with this. So how how do you decide how many uh, measurements you need to perform? Yeah, so uh, this depends, of course, on the on the on the, the problem that we are trying to, to address. So um, let's say at least we need to review a few uh, measurements for exactly the same liquid in order, you know, to have some statistics on the same uh, on the same liquid. Then when we uh, when we need to let's say um, estimate or produce a, a generally a model. Of course, the more uh, the more sample, the better. 
right? But um, of course, we do not have uh, infinite power to test in the lab all the possible combinations or all the possible uh, discrete values that we can think of. So it's um, it's always a matter of it's an empirical way of you know testing and uh, going back and see is this enough uh, or not. And uh, of course, on the resolution of the measurement that we that you want to to obtain. So this depends also on the sensitivity or the variation uh, of the um, of the um, conductive polymer response uh, when we vary slightly or um, in a larger way the, the concentration of a certain analyte. So we first need to find out what is the sensitivity, what is the best that we can resolve of a certain ion. And based on that, we need to design the, the experiments. And, and sorry, and the second part related with when you change the sensor, yes, so imagine another batch of sensor, do you usually need to adjust the number of measurements that you need to perform? You mean to use a completely another hypertaste sensor to yes. the same problem? Okay, so this uh, depends on uh, um, how the, um, let's say that the polymers can be um, reproducible uh, from one sensor to another sensor. So some of the polymers have shown a good reproducibility and some, uh, some others with a less reproducibility. So what we are trying to do now is uh, to, let's say, uh, we are, there are multiple angles of attack, right? So we can uh, first think of uh, um, recalibrating the, the second sensor based on the data that we obtain on the first sensor. While if the training is, um, is not, um, doesn't take too much time, we can think of retraining the, se the second sensor. Uh, for small uh, use cases, of course. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks again, Gianmarco, um, for the excellent presentation. So um, it's time to move on. Uh, I think after, you know, enhanced uh, visual verification, electronic tongue, now it makes sense that we are setting the stage for the um, electronic nose. So it's my pleasure to have a uh, Christelle and, and Dan here to um, discuss with us about high speed, high sensitivity vapor detection using MOS technology in the food supply chain. So uh, Christelle and Dan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Alrighty, we're gonna be talking today about some work that, that's been going on for a while on detecting things from um, the scent. Uh, basically looking at vapors that are given off and using metal oxide semiconductor technology uh, to do so. Um, and the reason you might want to use scent is it's, it's one of those things that is uh, detectable at extremely low concentrations, which lets you detect things much earlier when they might be a problem. Next slide. The basic idea is um, uh, we're going to have the metal oxide semiconductor, a set of them, go through and uh, sense um, uh, and react to a scent that's, that's been vaporized. That combination of responses is then going to go through some kind of machine learning. Uh, and we're going to try to put it together to identify what it is this, or what the scent is that, that we're detecting. Um, in the broad case, you would have many sensors and want to detect many different things. Um, the industrial applications that we're looking at today, um, we're looking at very specific sensing. Is something there or not? Uh, near the end, we'll show sort of how the system can be used to detect, for example, if your um, vegetarian bacon was fried in um, uh, vegetable oil or whether it was fried in uh, lard. Um, so we'll use that as sort of a, a, an example to get to for, for what this might be used for. Um, but first, let's talk about the specifics of how the sensors work. And for that, I'm going to turn it over to Christelle for a little bit. Thanks, Dan. Um, so our goal is really to build an electronic nose from scratch, from A to Z. So it's a very interdisciplinary project, and uh, we like to break it up into three big components that require very different types of expertise. The first one is about the sensing materials. The second part is about the hardware 
to integrate these uh, sensing materials and also to be able to run gas sensing experiments. And the last one is about the data science after we collect the data. And this will be sort of the outline of our presentation. I'll talk about the first half and then Dan will take over for the second half. So let's start with the sensing materials. Um, when it comes to gas sensing technologies, there are a lot of things out there. But we decided to focus on chemiresistors, which is a class of materials that will show a change in their electrical properties and they react with a gas analyte. And among chemiresistors, we decided to focus our efforts on metal oxides, uh, just because they have a, you know, pretty high sensitivity, but also because they're pretty low cost and they can easily be mass produced. But before telling you what we do in the MOS space, I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes to talk about uh, the MOS principle and requirements. And so one thing that we need to keep in mind is that most metal oxides at room temperature are gonna be insulating. And so what we want is to bring them in a semiconducting regime because that's uh, in that regime that we can really accurately monitor small changes in resistance. And in order to do that, it's important to bring the MOS material to a temperature somewhere around two to 400 degrees Celsius. So that's a really important point to remember. Heating a MOS sensor is a stringent requirement for it to be functional. Now, by default, our MOS material is going to be sitting in air. Um, and so what's going to happen is that oxygen from air is going to like to bind on the MOS surface just because oxygen is, is very electronegative. And it's going to steal some electrons from the MOS layer and create a depleted layer at the surface. Um, so on that slide, the state here on the left is our, uh, the same state I was talking about, is our reference state in clean air. Uh, if we look at the resistance of the MOS, it corresponds to a baseline resistance. And then when we have a gas analyte that, uh, you know, comes next to our MOS, we are going to have some redox reactions between this analyte and the oxygen absorbed at the surface of the MOS. And for example, in the case of reducing gas, we're going to consume these oxygen ions. So the depleted layer is going to be thinner. And that's going to be translated in a decrease in resistance. So when we see a change in resistance of our MOS, we know that the MOS has reacted with something and it has um, um, identified uh, a gas around. And so after the reducing gas, um, has, you, know, you know, if it goes away, um, you know, the, these reactions are reversible. And so basically the resistance of the MOS is going to recover back to its baseline resistance. So this is how a MOS uh, sensor works. And so when it came about, um, you know, um, our work, like, you know, when we decided to work on uh, improving MOS materials, the first thing that we did was to look at state-of-the-art commercial MOS materials, open them up and look at their morphology by SEM to see how we could improve them. And so what I'm showing here is the cross-section of two different uh, MOS materials from two different brands, but they are targeting similar gases. In particular, they have ethanol and hydrogen in common. And we were actually, uh, surprised to see that except for being really thick, which is not such a good thing for gas sensing because it's mostly based on surface reactions. So it's not a good thing to have 10 microns between where the you know gas sensing happens and where the electrodes are. So except for being both pretty thick, uh, they were very different. One looked very amorphous. The other one looked more crystalline. Uh, one looks um, pretty dense. The other one has a lot of big pores in between. So it became pretty clear that there was still a lot of room for material optimization um, to you know, boost the sensor's performance. So when we talk about sensor's performance, there's a long list of things that we can um, think about improving. Um, so as a start, we decided to focus on sensitivity. And so the way uh, we went about it is that uh, we decided to use two different sol uh, solution-based processes to prepare metal oxides with thermodynamics behind them being quite different. Um, so there was a very high probability to obtain very different character characteristics for a given oxide, in particular in terms of brain size and density, uh, with the goal uh, being really to identify key parameters to boost a MOS sensitivity. And so these two solution-based processes are the Soljob process and the DECO process. And so uh, the Soljob chemistry one is also known as soft chemistry. It is a continuously evolving process that relies on hydrolysis and condensation reactions, which I'm showing here. And so these reactions start as soon as the precursors are mixed together and typically proceed rather slowly at room temperature. And they slowly uh, build up a 3D network over time. So this is what I'm showing here. We start with a solution that has individual molecules. And then through that condensation reactions, we have the 3D network of the oxide that's forming. 
Um, in order to uh, speed up the condensation process, we can heat up our system. And typically it takes temperatures as high as 400 degrees Celsius for an hour or even longer to reach a high level of condensation. On the other hand, we have the DECO process, uh, which stands for delayed ignition combustion. It's slightly less known, but also a quite effective process to make oxides through combustion reactions. And unlike sol gel, nothing happens at first when we mix the precursors together. And the combustion reaction really starts when enough energy is provided to the system to ignite it through temperature. But for this process, a typical temperature that we need to achieve is uh, somewhere between 200 and 250, just for a short amount of time, uh, just long enough to ignite the system, kick off the combustion reaction. And so the different thermodynamics of these two processes is nicely illustrated by this TGA graph that shows the weight of our system as a function of temperature. And so if we ignore the little bit of solvent evaporation that we have in the beginning, what we see really is that for the sol gel system, as we provide more and more energy to the system, we have um, uh, 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 we we are forming our um, oxide network, and it reaches uh, when we reach about 600 degrees Celsius, we see no weight loss anymore, uh, indicating that we have fully converted our system to our oxide. Regarding the deco process, as you can see, uh, when we reach about 200 degrees Celsius, we have ignition, combustion, and all the weight loss is happening all at once. And then as we keep increasing the temperature, nothing happens anymore, indicating that already by 200 degrees Celsius, we have achieved our uh, fully uh, condensed uh, oxide network. So very different thermodynamics. Um, and so to summarize here, our goal is to prepare the same metal oxide using these two processes, then check for differences in morphology, ideally um, changing only one parameter at a time, even though it's not always uh, easy. And finally, identify key parameters for making um, higher sensitivity MOS sensors. So here I'm showing a couple of examples of things that we have achieved. Um, this, uh, on these two images are um, indium oxide thin films prepared by either sol gel or deco. Um, in both cases, we have about the same thickness, 35 nanometers or so. So as you can see, much thinner than the commercial sensors. And the main difference between these two films is the grain size. Um, they're both on the low side, uh, you know, six to eight nanometers for the deco process um, that we can see here by TM pretty nicely, or 15 to 20 nanometers for sol gel. So again, very small grain size in both cases, but we do have a 2x difference between um, this, these two films. And when we did some sensing experiments using acetone uh, in pretty low concentrations, we saw um, uh, systematically a 1.5 time difference in sensitivity between these two films with the higher sensitivity being obtained for the, the, the uh, thin film with the smallest grain size. So grain size is definitely very important and it's good to minimize it to boost the sensor sensitivity. Um, then I'm showing another example here where uh, we prepare tin oxide with different um, surface area. So we started with the same sol gel formulation and we just processed it in different conditions. And by doing so, we achieved a film that was completely dense or a film that had these macro pores here forming throughout the film without even using um, any templating agent or anything, just by processing it in different conditions. And so what's nice is that because they come from the same formulation, we know that the only difference we have is actually um, the, that um, presence of pore. So an increased surface area for this particular material here that I'm showing. And so when we did the same sensing um, experiments using acetone and those same you know, low concentrations, again, we saw a 2x difference in sensitivity uh, with the higher sensitivity obtained with higher surface area. So again, here, um, surface area, we see that surface area is critical um, and we need to maximize it in order to boost the sensor sensitivity. So similarly, we uh, prepared you know, other uh, MOS sensors. We have by now a small library of MOS that we can play with. Uh, but of course, the final test for us is really to compare our materials to commercial sensors. Uh, but for that, we need we, you know we needed to be able to integrate those materials into our Enos prototype because in the beginning we were just looking at single sensors like this where we just deposit our film on top of some electrodes on a simple substrate and then we were just heating them up by putting them on a hot plate. But as you remember, probably um, we need to you know absolutely heat the um, our MOS sensors in the Enos prototype, so we need to have some sort of a microheating platform on top of which we are going to deposit our moss. 
Um, and so initially, 30 years ago, you know, the sensors were pretty you know, large. They had, um, um, they were pretty, pretty much heated nonstop uh, during uh, when they were in use. Whereas nowadays, you know, we've made a lot of progress. Um, the, the footprint of the sensors is very small and the technology to heat them up is based on a microheating platform with a suspended membrane, which is critical to minimize heat loss and be able to uh, heat up and cool down the sensors pretty quickly. And so this is really what we wanted for our MOS materials. And there are companies out there that will sell naked platforms that one can use to deposit a MOS um, material on top. But those platforms are going to be really small and they're not compatible with the spin coating techniques that we use to deposit our moss materials in the form of really thin films yet homogeneous. So we decided to make our own platforms. Um, so we leveraged the expertise of our colleagues at IBM Tokyo in thermal simulation to come up with a nice design with you know, a heating area that's really uniform, um, as you can see here in this temperature profile. And based on that design, we came up with nanofabrication processing steps and we built everything in house, ending up with something like what you see here, which is a wafer. We work with two inch wafers right now. It can be easily scaled up. Um, but uh, on these wafers, we have a four by four array of microheating devices on top of which we can uh, nicely spin coat our you know, MOS formulations. And in one shot, we uh, obtain you know, 16 nominally identical sensors that, that we can either use for statistics or that we can integrate in different you know, prototypes and so on. And so on that slide here, I'm showing a close up of one device. Um, this square that you see at the center is our suspended uh, membrane. It is about two microns thick. And on top of that, we have that serpentine here, which is the heater. Uh, then we deposit an insulating layer, and then we have interdigitated finger that you can see here, which are going to be the sensing electrodes for the MOS material. So on top of these uh, fingers, we deposit the MOS by spin coating, so it goes everywhere. And so we are going to just uh, reveal the contact pads here um, by ion milling. And so through these two pads, we are going to flow current to heat up the heater. And then through these two pads here, we can apply a voltage and monitor the resistance of the MOS. Now, one little bump along the road is that when we calibrated the temperature, maximum temperature we could reach under the maximum voltage we can apply, we realized we could only reach 100 to 200 degrees Celsius when our uh, target was really 400 degrees Celsius, uh, because that's typically where we get the maximum sensitivity for a MOS. But you know, it was not such a big deal in the end because even at slightly lower temperature, you can still obtain a response for, you know, for a given sensor. So we move forward with our initial um, uh, fully fabricated and integrated sensors. Uh, we added them into our ENOS. Um, so we integrated uh, indium oxide and tin oxide alongside a few uh, state-of-the-art commercial MOS sensors that were already in there. And on this slide, I'm showing some recent interesting results that we obtained with these two IBM sensors while tackling a healthcare related use case that we are studying in collaboration with um, the Gawad group at Stanford University. Uh, Dr. Gawad is a pediatric hemato hematologist uh, and also an associate professor. And together we're working to see if we can use electronic noses as devices for um, rapid diagnosis of blood infections. To give you an example, uh, children with cancer have very weak immune systems. So if they get a blood infection, it is critical to have a fast diagnosis to target the correct ant antibiotic to give them. Um, but currently, you know, it's done with bacterial cultures and they take several days to come back. And so common practice, uh, you know, with cancer patients is to not wait and just give them uh, antibiotics right away, but without knowing if they will be effective. So of course this is not ideal and we're hoping to change that by getting a diagnosis with an ENOS you know, in less than an hour or so. But of course the first step is to check whether bacteria can even be detected using MOS sensors. And so what I'm sharing on this slide is initial results obtained with an IBM ENOS that is set up at Stanford, uh, where the you know, group of Dr. Gawad runs experiments with real blood samples from cancer patients. So the nose is basically sniffing the headspace of vials with blood samples with and without bacteria. And so on that slide, we see um, samples with bacteria shown in green and samples without bacteria shown in blue. And so of course, what we want to see is that when there is a you know, presence of bacteria, we wanna see a change in resistance um, shown by the sensors. And this is precisely what we see with our IBM sensors, as you can see, uh, without bacteria, the resistance level is much higher than with uh, the bacteria. 
Whereas for all the commercial sensors, and there are eight of them in that nose, um, the response is pretty much flat bacteria, no bacteria, we don't see much of a difference. So we're really excited uh, by these promising initial results, um, which show that you know, all our optimization uh, work uh, about the mouse morphology seems to really be uh, paying off. And so now I'll hand it over to Dan, who will talk about uh, uh, the second part of the hardware uh, regarding the hardware of the project. Thank you. So when we started working on the Enos project here at Almaden, um, the, the focus was on a large number of sensors and trying to get them all working together. And it created some interesting results. Um, but uh, when we started to deploy it out to our clients, we found that there, there were a few things that didn't quite line up with what they needed. The first was um, while the original sensor drew air from the environment, uh, we discovered that for some things like blood, you actually need to vaporize it, right? You need some way to encourage the chemicals that you're interested in sensing to go into the air. And that's an application specific vapor production. So um, with Stanford, for example, we're working with them. They've developed a method that works really well for, for bringing it into the air. Um, once that happens, um, uh, we go against the sensor material and use a microcontroller for operating the system. Uh, prior, we had sort of a standalone system that sent its data to the cloud for analysis. Um, we were schooled by the Stanford people that um, medical data can't uh, be sent to the cloud. It needs to stay local, at least for under HIPAA in most cases. So we moved to a plug and play hardware solution that sits on a bench and allows benchtop analytics. So that was a slight change as we moved to actually deploying. Next slide. Uh, to give you an idea, the, another change was uh, rather than gathering the data and bringing it into the cloud for analysis, we've moved to a real-time data science workbench that um, runs as the data is coming through and gives you the results more as they're happening. And this is pretty important because one of the other things that we found was, while in the lab, if you take an hour to run an experiment, that's great. If you're trying to do you know, tests from 50 batches of uh, bacon, uh, then you need to really be able to do them much more fast quickly on the order of seconds or minutes, not on the order of hours. Um, so the ability to see the data develop in real time, and once you've got confidence, you can say, okay, I've sniffed enough. I don't need to sniff anymore. I can move on to the next sample is pretty important. Next slide. So we've moved to Jupyter Notebooks with real-time databases to reflect the current measurements. Um, and they have the ability for personalized data processing and plotting. Um, various applications, for example, the detection of uh, the metabolic byproducts of bacteria, certain bacteria do require a specific analysis um, and some information on the sensitivity, the drift recovery, and, and whatnot. Um, go back a slide. Sorry. Uh, there was a question. Um, uh, can the nose be trained for security reasons to detect anthrax or other bacterial pathogens? Uh, there's a, so, uh, and the, uh, the uh, Gerard uh, also brings up, what about uh, cancers and COVID and whatnot? Um, the answer is we need to look at the metabolic byproducts of certain um, uh, either bacteria or the human body when it's in particular uh, regimes and get samples to, to identify or, or to begin to look if we can, can characterize the difference between them. Uh, absolutely, that is something we're, we're looking to um, uh, work on with our colleagues at Stanford and look at the sort of ways that you gather those samples in order to do the analysis. Uh, uh, as I said earlier, there are a number of different sensors that all are slightly are sensitive slightly differently to uh, different things. And if you're trying to identify or make a binary decision, there's a constellation of sensors that are gonna give you a good clean separation between the two types. So we've got a fair bit of work going on right now in identifying for a given uh, determination or discrimination we seek to do, what the right constellation of sensors is. Next slide. 
Um, all of this leads us to data analysis for specific industry applications. So looking at, as Christelle said, things in healthcare, things in food safety um, and, and whatnot, and looking at the specifics of those industries, what is most useful. The ENO's uh, big claim to fame in some sense is uh, in exquisite sensitivity. So if you can spot things in low quality quantities, you can spot them earlier and maybe be able to take actions earlier. Next slide. Uh, so the binary decision making we're looking for is uh, is something present or absent? Uh, you know, in looking at, for example, with a chemical company, is there a leak of a particular monomer? If so, can you can you tell me where it is? Um, so the focus ends up on setting appropriate setting an appropriate operating point. Uh, there was a question that. Uh, chat about specificity. And obviously there's a trade-off in any sensing system. You can trigger early and often with a lots of false positives, or you can trigger late and you're always right, but you may miss something. And the proper operating point to set is very different depending on the industry and the operation. If you're sniffing, for example, soil samples for oil and you're gonna drop $20 million to draw, drill that well, um, then you probably wanna be pretty sure you've got it right. If you've got something where you're doing just a pre-screen, for example, for sepsis, and you're gonna go do a, a follow-up um, um, test that's slightly more expensive, then you know it's okay if, if some false positives sneak through. That's the reason for the secondary test. As noted, there's a secondary focus on throughput. The more you can sample, or the more samples you can process per hour, the better. And understanding and limiting confounders is key. Uh, one thing we've learned about metal oxide semiconductors is there are a surprising number of things that are common in the environment that can uh, gum up the sensors. Um, I, I, I think um, uh, you know standard kitchen caulking uh, is a is a great one. So it's you want to make sure that you've identified how to keep things like that from getting into the sensor uh, and keep problems from happening. Uh, as a result, we deploy in environments that are somewhat more controlled than they just you know, sniff the air wherever it is. Next slide. So just to give you a sense of what, how the system works, um, this is sort of a blow up of what Crystal was speaking of before. Um, something comes in, we pulse the heater, you see that decay uh, as the oxygen gets consumed off the surface. Um, that decay happens even if there is no analyte there, it's just slower. So what we're looking at is how fast a particular sensor responds to a particular analyte. And the beauty here is that different sensors respond at different speeds to different analytes. Next slide. Um, so the peak gives us some sense of the uh, concentration and the decay is the speed of combustion. And a given compound will, in essence, burn with a characteristic rate for a given sensor. And different sensors burn the same compound at different speeds based on grain size, material, temperature, and so forth. And our goal then is to identify a minimal constellation of sensors that can quickly and accurately answer a specific question. Next slide. Um, so uh, just to give you a sense of how it works and the math behind it, uh, we're gonna get a response curve that looks like a decay associated with a particular sensor. Uh, and we're gonna fit it. So we're gonna say, you know, this response curve is some constant times an exponential of a decay rate plus an offset. Uh, and what we want to do is look at those Ds. And what's interesting, next slide, um, we'll look at the results from a control that's clean, dry air, um, soybean, oil, and lard. Uh, and as you see, there's a bit of a difference from lard over the soybean oil for this detector. This detector, this particular detector, is not sensitive at all to soybean oil, um, but it is quite sensitive to lard. So if we go to the next slide, we can uh, offset and normalize and really get a sense that this sensor has a strong response to the lard uh, and, and almost no response, actually a slightly negative response to the soybean. So if you're interested in placing a sensor over um, uh, you know, your, your processed bacon because you wanna make sure that the vat that the bacon is cooking in is got soybean oil and not lard, this is a QA that you can run and just make sure that, that there is no cross-contamination, especially in a plant that may be providing uh, uh, services to a number of food manufacturers. Next slide. 
Uh, do you want to take that one, Christelle? Sure, I can finish. So um, basically, uh, you know, Dan gave you a good overview of uh, what we're doing in the, um, in the analytics space of things. Um, and so for, you know, the next steps, we plan to um, prepare and integrate more IBM sensors um, based on our MOS library. So far, we have integrated uh, tin oxide and indium oxide, but we have a few more. In particular, these are N-type. We're also planning on, on integrating P-type sensors, MOS sensors. Um, we plan to um, implement that you know, plug and play prototype that we talked about, um, implement the data science workbench and try to get everything um, uh, real time. Um, and so in terms of our applications right now, we're mainly focusing on uh, that blood infection um, use case, just because we're getting very ex exciting results. Uh, but definitely, you know, the food industry is another uh, in, like industry where um, very interesting use cases could be targeted as well. And that's it for our presentation. And we'll be happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you so much, Christelle and Dan, for covering the span, you know, from science to technology to applications. Uh, it was really uh, great. Um, we had two questions already during the talk. Are there any others? I see um, Joao, you want to go first? Yeah, uh, many thanks for the very nice presentation. Actually, this is interesting because we've been working on um, MOS sensors to Euro TNL. Uh, it's quite uh, uh, interesting work that you've done. So it's, uh, it's nice because we've been working in P-type sensors instead of N-type. Um, one of the questions I, I mean, you, it's interesting because some of the problems you reported here are actually the problems that we've been having in our fabrication. So it's very similar. Uh, and one of the things I wanted to ask is that, is there, there was any uh, specification regarding uh, the size of the sensor and the power consumption? Because the eater can actually be uh, dominant in that case. So how did you decide it for the size of the sensor and the power consumption? Um, the size of the sensor, we just wanted to uh, minimize it as much as possible without it being too small, because obviously then you're getting limited sensitivity. To tell you the truth, uh, we decided on, so currently the, the sensing area is like one by one millimeter or so. And okay. it, it was mainly because um, this way the chip was still easily handleable yes. by us because if they become too small uh, as a start for us it's very difficult right but yeah. we haven't really optimized the dimensions that's that's my main point we just went with something we tested it and uh we're happy to see that we still get a response it could be uh optimized by going slightly different dimensions yeah and what about the power consumption i mean what type of power consumption do you get when you turn on the heater so i think right now we're in the 100 milliwatts uh okay. type power consumption um so there are more power efficient uh platforms out there um as a store we wanted something that was not crazy in terms of power consumption um, All right. again because you know the the smaller uh your, the sensor, the lower the power consumption, we could go in that direction to decrease power consumption further. Maybe we'll pay the price in terms of sensitivity. It's, it's right. So one more question, so I don't monopolize this and get my colleagues to, to do more. Um, uh, you had problems with the temperature. So how did you measure the temperature? How did we measure it? So I have a slide I can show you. Um, let me share again. Because you said that you were not able to reach the 400 degrees, right? Correct. Yeah. So I have one slide here that I can share with you on the, oh. the last one. OK, whatever. You can see it. Um, so we took a couple of uh, electrical measurements. Uh, the first one was measuring the resistance um, of um, the heater as a function of the power that went through right. it. Mm -hmm. And we can only apply up to five volts. So we looked at the delta in resistance between zero and five volts, and it's about 52 ohms. And then the second uh, measurement we did was to actually place the whole mass, like the, in, like the, the microheating platform inside a high precision oven 
and we oh. monitored the heater resistance as a function of temperature. We couldn't go too high in temperature, but thankfully the response is very linear. So that was very really linear. Helpful. Yeah. Okay. So you extrapolate then for the higher temperature. Right. And so that gives us 112 <laughs> degrees, but we know in reality it's slightly higher than that because in one case you're only heating the heater, in the other case you're heating the entire ch you know chip. Um, yeah. So we know yeah. this 52 would correspond to slightly higher resistance here, not like so, and uh, so fi not 52, but higher. We don't know exactly how much, but we're saying okay, maximum yeah. twice this amount. And so for twice this amount, we would reach 200 degrees Celsius. So we know we're reaching somewhere around this temperature, even though it's not clear. Okay. Exactly which one. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's very good. So I stop here my question because otherwise I will continue asking more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is very interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, there's one more question or at least one raised hand by, by Hugo. Yeah, thank you again for the excellent uh, presentation. My question is a little bit really on the application side, especially the, that uh, essay with, uh, mm. with the blood samples. Yep. So, so my question is how, how do you or how your partners uh, deal with, um, with the volatilization of the, of the sample? Uh, this is, I have particular interest on that because I actually work with some gas diffusion sampling at some point. And uh, we have also some ideas about, uh, about uh, samples that we'd like to explore that, uh, that, that path for, for sensing. And another one just to, to finish is about the, um, the design of the experience. So uh, do you first uh, characterize the sample uh, and try to model, modulate the response of the sensors to your target compounds? So what is your, your workflow on that? Uh, I'll, I'll take the, that in two steps. The, the first is, uh, I'm not sure that Stanford's sharing how they're uh, volatilizing their blood samples at this time. Um, that, that, that is IP that they're developing, so I'm not going gonna, I'm, I'm to spill the beans on that one. Um, in terms of workflow, it's an excellent and interesting question. So we're working with the theory group here at Almaden on a linear programming approach where we can go through and characterize the sensor's response to you know, the A, the B, the C, whatever the things we want to differentiate are. And then um, they have some kind of a, a, a greedy linear programming um, that takes that characterizations that we get from each of the sensors and uh, tries one and then swaps the other. And I mean, doing the exhaustive search, of course, would take forever, but um, they can um, get something that's provably within a constant factor of optimal um, in reasonable time. Um, but that's a, an interesting linear programming problem and one that we're really having fun working with them on uh, because the, you know, the more sensors that you have, the more different MOS devices you have, the more you're opening yourself up to something failing or getting poisoned or needing to be replaced. or So you really would rather the minimal set that lets you do the differentiation. The lard and uh, soybean one was, was a perfect example in that it turns out one of our sensors responded at a particular set point to lard and didn't respond at all to soybean, right? So that's that's the 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 perfect re result, right? Single sensor gives you great results, no confusion. You you know exactly what your characterization looks like. You just need to run it at the proper operating point. Um, but yeah, so it's definitely something where um, you know once you realize that each sensor operating at a different temperature can have very different responses, you. Uh, essentially can get hundreds or even thousands of sensors by just varying the temperature on the yeah. dozen or so sensors you have. And now you've got a giant pile of data and uh, that you have to sort through and figure out the right combination on. Yeah, so so sorry, just just a, a, a quick question. And have you been have you so you can uh, distinguish well when you when you of course when you change temperatures the chemical families that you are detecting uh, or not? It's a really good question. We have some theories on that uh, and we're looking forward to testing them this summer. Um, we, we would really like to see what the auto ignition temperature of the sample versus the temperature of the sensor and how close you have to get to the auto ignition temperature before you start sensing and whether there's a sharp peak there. Um, because uh, so for families of compounds that have uh, high temperature 
auto ignition points in, in air, um, you know, you, you expect that there would be less sensitivity than lower. But um, we, we were able to see, for example, running the heater at 60% power, lard and soybean respond almost the same. And at 40% power, neither of them responds very well the same. And at 50% power, lard gets a strong response and soybean oil gets no response. So understanding where that proper set point is, is, is critical. And it's very fortunate that the heaters that Cristel has developed are very good at knowing how hot they get. So we get a lot of control over what the, the bias point is. And that can become a real, real interesting way to vary the, the scope of things that we can detect. Great question. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. We should I think we have at some point to follow up our discussion? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, yeah, so as, as always, I'm happy to act as a as a contact point for for today's speaker. So, um, in the interest of time, we'll we'll conclude the discussion here now, and um, like to say a special thanks again to to our presenters today. So, Tony, Jamarco, Cristel, Dan. Thanks. Thanks very much for your time. For the excellent talks and uh, thank you to the audience and you know as always uh, send us feedback about the organization of these events i'm looking forward to the next follow-up so uh, that concludes uh, today's session and actually the the the, um, the three scientific lectures that we have uh, that we have organized uh, for now around around food safety thank you all uh, have a great rest of the day and a great great evening thank you uh, thank you thank, thank you so much bye bye, bye.